Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Rigoberto Stewart and the society for, for the kind invitation. I have uh, uh, very deep uh, links with the society. I'm the Peruvian representative of the society. And a few years ago, I met uh, some of the founders, and I have a very good uh, um, feels about the work and the action that the society is uh, carrying out since that time. Uh, first of all, it is necessary to remark a uh, terminological uh, terms um, precision. Uh, we are talking about, of course, informal economy as underground economy, as the, our host uh, explained a few minutes ago. Informal economy or underground economy or hidden economy or submarine economy has a lot of different uh, names. It's in fact a very complex uh, social and economic phenomenon. Since the point of view of a, a, a simple definition, underground economy or informal economy that uh, usually uh, is uh, named in Latin America is mostly the kind of activities carrying out outside the law. In some sense, we can difference between those activities, informal or underground, from uh, crimes. Informals are not uh, criminals, and informal activities or underground activities are not crimes. Are, uh, in some sense, activities with legitimacy, but, out, uh, but carrying out outside the law as a result of a law that imposes so costly system that it is impossible to live with. So, it is, uh, I think, it is correct if we define uh, informality or underground economy or underground activities as those activities with legal goals but illegal means. Those activities that, in fact, are not stealing nothing from nobody. Those activities as, for instance, street sellers in the streets of Latin America, buying and selling goods, offering services, but for different reasons, maybe barriers to the access to the market or so costly taxes, are carrying out outside the law and without complying with the requirements of a normal legality. So if we accept that de definition, we can understand a little bit about our story. Informal activities, underground markets, black markets, hidden economy, submarine economy, as you, can, as you wish, are very characteristic in uh, third world economies, especially in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Those activities are public, are uh, carried out in public without any kind of uh, intrusion for the state in a sort of uh, a symbiosis, or in, a, in a sort of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, living in a peace with activities carrying out in a very uh, formal and characteristic way. In Peru, my country, and in Latin America, underground economy has a very important dimension, not only from economic point of view, but also from the sociological point of view. In fact, if we take a few of the most important fields of our life in Peru or Latin America in general is the same thing. We can find that underground economies that not are underground, of course, are over the ground, are totally uh, public, and there's not nothing hidden about that. 
uh, you can see, you can appreciate a very impressive uh, uh, data. In the case of the housing activity, and in the case of housing, in Peru, more or less 50 percent of housing in the, in the uh, urban area is or belongs to the informal sector because those areas are developing outside the law without complying with zoning, without complying with uh, normal and usual licenses that the governments, uh, uh, municipalities, uh, city councils, or even the central government or, or, or provincial government, government uh, uh, imposes as uh, the normal uh, way in order to build a neighborhood and construct a, a house. But not only in the housing uh, uh, area you can see a, a very important presence of informal activities in Latin America and also in Peru. In fact, it probably is the most notorious one, but not the only one. If you take every main capital of Latin America, you will find informal housing, named by different terms. In Peru, it's called Pueblos Jóvenes, Young Towns. In other countries of, uh, of Latin America, it's called Barriadas, Barrios Marginales, Ciudad Satélite, Cayampa. Uh, or whatever different name in order to make a difference between the traditional city and the, one, and the new one. And what is, from the libertarian point of view, unbelievable with the housing, with the underground housing or informal housing experience is that in those areas almost does not exist presence of the state of the formal state. In those areas, in the, in the, in the formal neighborhoods, in Pueblos Jóvenes, like uh, they are called in Peru, who rule the area is the people themselves. You know, for instance, that in Latin America we have the Roman civil system of law, not the Anglo-Saxon customary law. Well, what is very impressive is that in that areas, for instance, normal judges, the professional ones that uh, deals with the suits in the, in the formal society, does not exist. They do not have practical jurisdiction. Of course, they have theoretical one, but they don't have practical jurisdiction over those areas. And the people solve themselves their problems uses something called assemblea, which is assembly, but in fact, they act like a jurist trying to solve conflicts between persons without the use, without the use of the formal administration of justice system and without the use of the law, because, of course, those people, in order to solve the conflict, not only use the assembly, the group of uh, citizens, uh, joined every Sunday in a pu public square in the, in the new neighborhood, but also in order to solve the problem, they use customary antecedents. They use customary uh, uh, precedents, not the civil code, not the Peruvian c civil code. So it is very, impost very important from the social point of view and from our um, theory of, uh, of uh, the origin of the institutions in a libertarian perspective, appreciate that uh, life laboratory in the cities of Latin America in order to see how it is possible that the pure interaction of the people outside the law and almost against the law can generate an alternative framework, an alternative institutional framework in order to compete against the state. And through the competition of the of, or through the competition against the state could create an alternative of evolution and could create also, of course, we hope, 
an alternative for the new liberty. Also, in the commerce field, uh, we have a very important experience of informal activity or underground economy, black and markets, or whatever you want to call that. Uh, it is uh, mostly seen as the uh, phenomenon uh, called vendedores uh, ambulantes, street sellers in English. People that uh, uh, sell goods and uh, uh, offer services in the streets. Almost every city in Latin America, and of course in all the countries of the third world, uh, has a very important uh, um, group of people working outside the law in the streets. Through that way, it is very impressive to see how the streets are the business school of the people, of the poor people in Latin America. Streets are a very practical business school because uh, you probably uh, suspect that uh, the access to education is uh, very limited in Peru, or probably in most part of Latin America, so the people uh, learn uh, about a cash flow not in, in one school, learn about, in, in fact, uh, in the streets. And that creates, and I, I, I am convinced totally of that, a new class of, entrepre of entrepreneurs among the poorest people of our cities. Remember that since uh, the end of the Second World War, in Latin America, especially in Peru and other countries, we had a very profound um, migration uh, of a phenomenon. In 1940, Peru was mostly a rural country, 45 Per percent, uh, 35 percent of the of the population lived in the cities, and the rest in in the in the um, in the rural area. In 1980, it was exactly the opposite. 65 percent of the population lived in uh, the urban area, and only the 35 in rural areas. Of course, as, as a result of, uh, also of agrarian reform that Professor. Carlos Sabino uh, make a comment uh, in, the, uh, in the last pre presentation. So in the commerce also exists a very important presence of, of, uh, of informal activities. Those guys, the street sellers, don't pay taxes, of course, and don't comply with the regulation because it is impossible to pay so high taxes and comply with the different li licenses that uh, Peruvian state impose on them. It's the same case with uh, little industries, handicraft, and different uh, artisans that are working outside the, the law. In order to, 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 to remark and to f present the origins of, uh, of, uh, of the problem, a uh, few years ago, we conducted a, a practical research trying to uh, prove our hypothesis. Our hypothesis in front of this problem was the following. If underground economy is important in housing, is important in, in commerce, is important in industry, is important in every part of relevance of our society, the question is how is the most important uh, cause of this? Our hypothesis uh, from the um, inspired in some sense in the economic analysis of law it was that uh, um, cost of legality probably will be the main cause. Usually we think that the law is neutral that has no costs. That is not true it's in the works of uh, Ronald Coase, Ronald H. Coase, uh, Nobel Prize winner. We know that uh, law uh, creates costs. We know also, of course, that market has costs, transaction costs, but we also know that law has costs. And uh, usually we think about the transaction, the transaction costs, the cost of use, the market, but uh, it is no good remark that also the law has costs. And we try to prove the cost of legality. We try first to find how to, how to measure the cost of legality, and then we try to, 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 to present some idea about the cost of legality. And for that, we try to, to, to make a empirical research. Our objective, our objective was the follow. We try to organize, to incorporate a little 
uh, enterprise in order to sell and buy things. And our main purpose was to simulate the incorporation, going through all the bureaucratic offices that exist mandatory for the law, avoiding, avoiding bribes, taking the time, and of course, trying to obtain the licenses, all the requirements, in order to fulfill the legal procedure. Well, we organized a group of simulators, young students, and we began our exercise. As the, at the end, we find the follow. First, it was necessary to get 11 licenses. Because without any of them, it was impossible to incorporate legally with the total legal situation, the corporation. It was necessary, went to a 45 different offices, including city council, ministers, and government. And it took 347 days, more or less, almost a year, 11 months, something like that, of red tape going back and forth and trying to obtain all the requirements, the seals, and the uh, licenses that are uh, part of the, of the law nominally uh, uh, called to, to, to deal with a incorporation of a little enterprise. We, uh, through, through that way, we shown that exists cause of legality. But also we find a very funny situation in order to present also the corruption uh, problem. Because during that simulation research, we were asked for a bribe more or less seven times. And only, remember it was a, a little enterprise. And we paid twice because it was impossible to continue without paying it. Remember that our purpose was not pay bribes, was try to measure all the red tape. But if we don't pay, at least in two op opportunities, it was impossible to continue. Of course, the presentation of, 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 our, of our simulation was a scandal in Peru. Scandal, everybody says that it's false. Everybody among the politicians, of course, but among the people uh, confirm our suspicions. So, law costs. And the cost of law is the main cause of underground economy. Through the law, you can create discrimination against, against the poor people. And remember that it is clear since Douglas North's work that there exists an inverse proportion between the cost of legality and the income of the population. If you belong to the poor, the poorest part of the society, the cost of legality is higher than if you are rich or you have a very important income. So the cost of legality creates discrimination, especially against the poor people. It is impossible to work with that kind of environment. That kind of environment is like a paper curtain. It's a paper wall that, in fact, discriminates the poor Peruvians and poor Latin Americans and the poor from every third world country from the access to markets. That's why that people, in a state of claiming socialism, are claiming back to their liberties through selling goods in the streets to making 
at least by invasion, their own housing settlements and regaining the right for property using the practical way, voting with their feet. That experience for us was also very dramatic from the political point of view because it presents the fight against oppression and the fight, fight for liberty as a very practical one, as a very simple one. The people know perfectly better than everybody of us what they want for life and what they want for work. So the people is trying to obtain liberties, trying to create spaces in order to develop their own energies, their own ideas and their own beliefs. With this background, which is the future of underground activities in the new millennium, well, it's hard to say, but let me present some idea about that. Since the fact of communism, of course, everybody of us uh, were very excited with, uh, with when uh, communism uh, went down. But since that time today, the term globalization, it presents for the international press as uh, the way in which liberty is gaining the war all around our planet. But it is necessary to take a little bit of precaution, cautions about this, because globalization to me today not only is the space of liberty, it could be also the space of new interventionism. Globalization could be socialization in an international way. Why? Because I suggest the following thesis. Governments learn and learn fast. And politicians, of course. And I can appreciate that the government are uh, passing their powers to some kind of international levels and concentrate at that levels so much force than any individual state. The states around the world are trying to organize some kind of super state even most powerful than any individual state itself. You can see that, you, you can see that in different fields. Intervention, the new right of intervention. Any government has the right of intervention, but this new authority, international authority, the socialist big brother, has the right of, of intervention. The case of Kosovo. I don't want, uh, it's not my, my subject, I don't know nothing about former Yugoslavia, but let me think uh, on the problem in the following way. Why not Peru or Colombia or whatever different country if uh, political correctness is different in each country? I don't know. Maybe uh, some bureaucrats in Geneva think that uh, Peruvian Japanese or, or, or different people are not good because, I don't know, spicy food or, 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 or maybe smoke, cigars, and why not invite them? Of course, the right of control is also passing from the national state to the supranational state. Discussion about internet. You know, they are trying to restrict the access of internet. It is hard, but it's not impossible. They can control the, C the CPU, the units. They can control also the telephone lines. It is impossible to introduce through hardware some political limitations in order to supposedly uh, keep uh, some vices outside the net, some uh, danger from the childhood, whatever they want. 
I see also other dangers, uh, of course, in Latin America, for us, is a, a, a continuous a, a menace, the problem of drugs. You know, Peru and Colombia and Bolivia has constantly the menace of, of uh, U.S. government against them because uh, control, uh, drugs control, and in fact, the government of the United States uh, think thinks that it has the right in order to, 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 to evaluate how is the behavior of the different nations about drugs, but why not about cholesterol, if cholesterol can, can, can kill more people than drugs? Or why not about uh, uh, literature? Why not? It's not any kind of reason in order to not expect that kind of limitation for our liberty. So I have fear. I have fear, of course, rational fear, in order to uh, uh, be very critical about globalization, especially because I am seeing how international bu bu bureaucracies are trying to reinforce the Power, the, the powers of the state through, national, through international organizations. You can see how the utopia, the socialist utopia is trying to, to be uh, carried out for those kind of organizations, and that means, in practical ways, limits our individual liberties. So probably in the future, uh, there will be uh, not only more informal or so underground activities, but also different uh, uh, informal activities. Why not think about uh, uh, some uh, um, informal uh, development and alternative internet if internet is controlled by the state? Why not think about also some freedom fighters is the, if uh, that supranational authority try to invade uh, their own lands? Why don't think about bias resistors? Lysander Spooner says that uh, biases are not crimes, but of course socialists think that biases are crimes. And uh, the people who have biases also will, will try to resist against those, those uh, new uh, um, bureaucrats or new kind of authorities trying to impose some kind of, of, uh, uh, of uh, regulations against them, them. So what could be my final word about this problem is the following. Underground economy, informal activities in Latin America and Peru presents a very complex and enthusiastic phenomenon because uh, uh, informals are in some sense people, poor people, trying to, 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 to gain for them the privilege and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the benefits of work freely and use that freedom in order to improve their own lives. But uh, probably, as I am saying, the cost of legality will increase during the globalization times. And I hope, I hope not, but I think that could be a paramount that if cost of legality in international terms go up during the globalization times, probably we could expect more informal activities and more informals all around the world. So probably much of us in that situation could be working outside the law, working outside that international law, trying to regain our rights for ourselves. The principal message of informality is poor people believe in liberty and know the benefits of liberty. They try to reivindicate private property, invading land, public land, and creating, and creating new neighborhoods. They are trying to reivindicate also the right to be entrepreneurs and making 
at the streets, converting the streets in the in a huge mall in which they try to sell different goods. And they are also reivindicating principles, liberty, as the way in order to improve personal life. That message is very powerful for all of us because I suspect that in the new millennium, liberty will have new enemies. Enemies hidden behind some very naive principles, globalization, new yes, justice, but terrible enemies. Think about that world in which international organization could decide if it is possible to invade one country for moral reasons. Think about that world in which judges has not jurisdiction limits. And as today, you can uh, present a, a suit against one tobacco, uh, American tobacco company in the United States from part of a, one Latin American country, or one uh, la, uh, Latin American government. Think about also new and more extended and complex regulations trying to restrict the distribution of knowledge, distribution of ideas, and the distribution of opinions. It could be a terrible world. So I'm very happy that our society exists, because I hope that our society could be the best instrument, the best way in order to make part of the resistance against the enemy of liberty and try to save in it from those people. So we are in the, thank, I think we are in the very hard time, the new millennium for the society, the new millennium for libertarians, and the new millennium for all of us is just the beginning, the beginning of the fight for liberty, the fight for freedom, and a fight for the individual rights, which are the only valuable thing that exists in our society. Thank you very much.